What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's a good amount of news to go over here, a lot of teasers for New York next week. And speaking of New York, I won't be doing a normal weekly update next week because I will be at the New York Auto Show. And so from Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be posting videos and maybe even into Friday, I'll be posting videos of the cars um, that are there and debuting. I'll be attending all the press conferences and everything in person. And so I'll be having like a mini weekly update. I'm gonna have just a playlist of all the video, of all the vehicles that are, I'm gonna be covering and all those videos will be in a playlist. So you'll still probably have roughly 30 minutes of car news to go through. It's just gonna be hopping from one video to, to the next and I'll have the playlist set up so you can just do autoplay and watch the playlist that way if you still wanna wait till Friday. Otherwise, you know, these uh, debuts will be happening mostly on Wednesday for all the big main ones and then some of the less exciting stuff that's uh, debuting, I'll probably wait till Thursday or Friday to post some of those. So um, yeah, that's how the news will go next week. The following week, I will have a normal weekly update but just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. So the first story here, the first thing that is rumored to debut next week is an entry-level performance Mustang. And so uh, Ford did announce officially that they are going to be revealing some type of entry-level Mustang um, at the New York Auto Show. And um, so that'll be an interesting uh, thing to see w which way that goes. Because, you know, we had a few months back, there was the leaked VIN document showing there was going to be a second EcoBoost option for the Mustang for the 2020 model year. It said 2.3 liter EcoBoost, and that was it. So... Uh, the main, I think most likely theory is that, you know, they're going to either throw the Focus RS internals into the EcoBoost Mustang and, you know, turn it up to that 350 horsepower the Focus RS did. Um, and that's, you know, seems pretty likely. The other option is they'll just have some type of unique tune for the 2.3, you know, totally unique to the Mustang. Um, and maybe it'll do more power, maybe less, who knows. Um, you know, in the past, so, you know, if they do call, end up calling this a Mustang ST, if it goes in line with the previous, uh, ST versions of other Ford models like the Edge ST when that went from the Edge Sport to the Edge ST it got like I think 20 extra horsepower so maybe instead of 310 horsepower we'll go up to 330 or something hopefully it'll be a little more than that um, but there's also talk about how Ford wanted to have a Camaro 1LE competitor for the four-cylinder and six-cylinder versions of the Camaro 1LE because uh, you know obviously there there's you know, when you get to the GT Mustangs, you have the performance pack level two and stuff that competes with the one LE kind of. Um, and so maybe they want to have something like this for the EcoBoost. Uh, there are also some more or less likely rumors that they're going to possibly put the 2.7 liter EcoBoost uh, V6 in the uh, in the EcoBoost Mustang there for a mid-grade and kind of reintroduce the V6. That seems a little less likely, especially given the VIN document. So we'll have to wait and see. There's also rumors, and in, instead of this being called a Mustang ST, it could be called the SBO as a throwback to the first uh, turbo Mustang back in the 80s. Um, so that, you know, is possible as well. But regardless, we don't have long to wait. We'll know in less than a week, and so cool to see that. And a car that was running around New York here on Thursday of this week was the mid-engine Corvette, which Chevy has finally officially announced is happening, and the review will be July 18th. And um, they don't say where or any kind of details about it, but that is uh, the, the numbers that are plastered there on the side of the uh, Corvette there. And of course, the eight is highlighted because this is the C8 generation of the Corvette. And and so that's all we really know. Mary Barra, you know, the CEO of General Motors, was in the passenger seat as it was going around New York, but it will not be revealed in New York, of course, not until July. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. They're trying to upstage everyone at New York uh, the week beforehand here, but it's not actually going to be at New York. So, um, but that's exciting. They also did announce that um, the last C7 will be auctioned off for charity on June 28th. So that means they will be ending production of the C7. There was rumors that it was going to be built alongside the C8. That does seem to be the case since this is the last one being built at the end of June and uh, that's going to be it for the uh, C7 and then I think you know it's been rumored that production is going to start up for the C8s uh, towards uh, winter end of this year or something like that. Another non-New York thing very briefly here is Audi has revealed the 2020 S6, S7, and S6 Avant. And so um, this is a European release. So we have some more details on the European versions, not quite as much on the American version. But um, for the American version here, we're going to get a 2.9 liter uh, turbo six cylinder, of course. Uh, it's basically the same motor as the RS5 Sportback. Uh, 450 horsepower in these, 443 pound-feet of torque, um, which is slightly 
slightly more than the RS5, um, but you know, not not by much. I think like six horsepower. Um, and so we don't have any other details about the powertrain, unfortunately, for the US version. Other than that, um, they didn't even say the transmission is going to be running, but most likely it's the eight-speed auto, like the RS5. Um, but for those in Europe and a few other areas, uh, there's going to be a diesel you're going to be able to get for the S6, S7, S6 Avant. And so that's going to be the three-liter V6 TDI that does uh, 349 horsepower, 516 pound-feet of torque. So that's going to be the same uh, power plant that you get basically in the SQ5 TDI. And um, so that's, again, a European-only thing. We will not be getting that engine here in the States. Um, but both the diesel and the gas engines uh, get um, turbo compressors that are electric, so there's you know no uh, spool time, makes it a little quicker. And they're also going to both get the 48-volt mount hybrid system, um, and that's something they're rolling out with you know all their new models here. And so that totally makes sense. Um, but they did give a little more details about the a diesel here for Europe. So um, those ones are going to be doing um, five seconds zero to 62 a time, um, and that's for the you know I guess for the S6. And if you go for the Avant, it's 0.1 seconds slower, uh, and also the same for the S7 there. Um, and so that's all very impressive. It's going to have with that 48 volt mount hybrid system, an eight kilowatt hour battery under the trunk uh, for it extended stop start and can coast for up to 40 seconds they say um but that's only going to be for parts of europe uh, they say that um you know we're not going to be getting it here in the states and the middle east isn't going to get it and neither is asia so just for europe basically um and so we don't have any uh, specs as far as zero to 60 times here for the gas powered versions um it's just you know again that 2.9 liter v6 uh but you know pricing is probably going to be around the same pricing as the uh, current you know previous gen s6 maybe a little bit more um other things here it's got a slightly lower suspension with a standard dynamic suspension they're calling it and it's a uh, 0.4 inches lower on the s7 0.8 inches lower on the s6 and s6 avant um and it's got an all-wheel drive system as standard of course with a torque split that uh, is usually 40 front 60 rear but it can send as much as 70 percent to the front and 85 percent to the rear uh if if conditions you request it. Uh, there's also going to be a brake-based torque vectoring system, um, and there's going to be six piston calipers uh, there on the front wheels as well. So going to be very, very, very powerful uh, as far as you know, handling and stuff. But I'm kind of disappointed it's a brake-based torque vectoring system and not an actual true, uh, you know, torque vectoring system. But there's also going to be an optional rear differential, uh, you know, limited slip, and then of course an optional rear wheel steering system as well if you want even better handling, which is cool. Um, you're going to be able to it's standard 20 inch wheels or there's 21 inches uh, available as well if you'd like. There's also a th optional three mode adaptive air suspension you can get if you want. And so um, that'll give you still good handling, but a little bit of a softer ride. Um, and then on the outside of all these, you know, of course, it's uh, basically the same formula they've used for S models in the past with the, um, you know, uh, like bright work there, aluminum looking uh, mirror caps and the quad tailpipes and uh, you know some other darker trim and badging and stuff like that on the inside there you know you can get some alcantara standard but there's also of course um, high-end leathers and stuff like you can see there my only comment I have to say about the front end of these models is those radar sensors. I know that, you know, they want to have the super advanced cruise control and all this kind of stuff, but there's other car makers, you know, like Cadillac Super Cruise that hides those so much better. Um, those just look hideous on the front of that Audi. Um, it doesn't blend with the grill or anything. If they want to have those you know, in the grill, then try and restyle the grill to incorporate them at least. I mean, that actually looks like it's a prototype or something with the way those are just kind of plastered on the front there. Um, or maybe integrate them into the headlights in the future or something and just have a blacked out part of the headlight there with that the sensors or something there's got to be a better way to incorporate that that just seems like such a lazy to approach to just like cut squares in the grill and toss those in basically but um yeah so that's the only thing otherwise i think you know they're gonna be very impressive of course and um anyway we don't have any kind of release date for these either yet but i'm assuming it's going to be uh towards the end of this year at the earliest uh so anyway cool to see that Mercedes uh, has several reveals going on in New York here next week, but the first one they already showed ahead of time here is the 2020 Mercedes AMG CLA 35. So it's the same mechanicals as the recently revealed A35 that I just talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this just has the more stylish CLA body and that's it. So that means it gets a two liter turbo four cylinder that does 302 horsepower, 295 pound feet of torque. It all runs through a seven speed dual clutch automatic and all wheel drive. Zero to 60 is in 4.6 seconds. Uh, 
uh, it gets a sportier suspension along with uh, drilled and slotted rotors here that are AMG specific um, and bigger than the regular CLA brakes. And the interior gets the same great A-class interior with sports seats as standard, although uh, there's even more aggressive seats available there if you'd like them. Um, there isn't any kind of pricing or release date for these yet, um, but uh, I think it could be a pretty cool competitor to the Audi A3 or S3 you know, version if they price it right. Um, you know, and so we'll have to wait and see. It could, you know, that could put it in the league of, you know, kind of where Golf R and stuff is, again, if they make it low enough in price, because this is lower than the 45, so I'm hoping it's going to be priced less than the previous CLA 45s we've had in the past. So we'll, we'll have to just have, wait and see here, but uh, it's a good combo nonetheless. I mean, those are like, you know, WRX STI numbers, and so cool to see that. Um, and if you are curious, there is still going to be a 45 version coming. That's coming at a later date, and my spy photographer, Brian Williams, actually got some snapshots of this uh, a week or two ago, and um, so it's just going to be a little bit more aggressive. There's rumors that's going to get two different versions, a normal and an S. The normal version, I think, is like going to be 375 horsepower or something, and then it could be over 400 for the S version of that. Um, and uh, supposedly it's rumored to have a drift mode and all that kind of stuff as well. So that would be the really cool one. But those ones are going to be the ones that are probably going to be well into the 60s, I'm guessing, for pricing. Um, but anyway, uh, cool to see that. Mercedes also announced that the next-gen GLS is going to debut in New York, along with the performance versions of the GLC, so most likely the GLC 43s at least, maybe the 63s too, um, and an addition 1886 version of the EQC. So 1886 is the year that Carl Benz patented the uh, first gas engine vehicle and so maybe this is kind of a throwback to that with this being the first largely produced electric vehicle for Mercedes um, and so so far getting back to the GLS that's the main debut uh, Mercedes has said it's going to be on the same MHA platform as the new GLE including its 48 volt electrical system and it's going to include the e-active uh, body control that allows it to kind of hop around and do all those crazy things that you saw when the GLE first came out um, the new GLS will also have a 2.3 inch longer wheelbase than the previous version um, to allow for a roomer interior. Uh, they're saying second row is especially going to be very spacious, but all three rows are going to have power seats as well, supposedly. And so anyway, interesting to hear that, and we'll see more again next week. Um, Acura has revealed the 2020 TLX PMC edition they'll be showing in New York here. And so they're only making 360 of them, and they're going to be hand-built on the same production line that builds the NSX in Ohio. And so once they're done building those, they're also going to be doing a limited run of MDX, PMC versions as well, um, but they didn't say how many of those or anything. They're going to be showing a prototype of that um, in New York, but um, yeah, so we don't have any pictures of it currently. But back to the TLX version here, though, um, they say it's going to be priced around $50,000, and basically it combines the A spec. Uh, package with the advanced package, which you usually can't get together. Um, so it's basically going to be a fully loaded TLX and um, it doesn't get any kind of performance improvements or anything like that. You know, we're still waiting for a Type S version, which uh, we've seen those spied running around with the more aggressive exhaust systems and stuff like that. Um, that isn't what this is. This is just something, I guess, before that. This does get unique Valencia Red Pearl paint, though, which is like a $5,000 paint option on the NSX usually. And it's exclusive to the NSX, but now it's going to be, uh, you know, here on these TLXs as well. But anyway, I mean, it's it's a cool idea to, you know, give people more options, but it can be so limited, you know, that's probably going to mean dealer markups. And even if it doesn't, I mean, I feel like most Acura fans would rather wait for the true Type S versions, which will be more powerful most likely and will be the performance ones to get in the collector's items, I'm assuming. And so in, anyway, we'll, we'll have to see how it goes. Those might be a couple of years away still. But in the meantime, this is cool. Super is going to be showing the 2020 Outback here here at the New York Auto Show, and we have this one teaser image that confirms it's going to continue to be a slightly lifted wagon version of the Legacy. This one based on the all-new Legacy, of course, um, and uh, so, you know, the, the Legacy debuted back in the Chicago Auto Show a couple of months ago, and so basically imagine that with body cladding, one inch higher suspension, and, you know, a roof rack. <laughs> that's basically, uh, on a wagon version, that's basically what you're going to get, and so there's some outlets that are like, oh, I wonder what it's going to look like. It's like, this is the least mistake serious reveal in New York by far. <laughs> like, uh, it's very clear. The only major change here is they're ditching the round fog lights they've had for decades and they're going to those bar ones instead there. Um, otherwise, though, it shouldn't be too many surprises there. Um, hopefully they do uh, reintroduce the Outback XT, though, since they do have the XT version of the Legacy here for 2020 with that turbo motor. That'll be cool. Um, and so that's the one to be excited about. 
And Hyundai has shown some teaser sketches here for the venue, which is the mini crossover that's debuting next week in New York. The front appears to be similar to the Kona, but the back end has a unique look to it. Um, and the most interesting thing that I noticed from these sketches that no one else is really talking about is that there doesn't appear to be a line drawn for the rear doors like there is for the front doors. Um, so this is suggesting it could possibly be a two-door, um, which would be pretty cool and kind of justify uh, the smaller size since, I mean, how I don't know how you can make the Kona even smaller and still have it be usable. I mean, if they actually do pass this thing off as a four-door, um, I mean, the back seat's going to be probably less usable than the one in my Mustang. Like, I don't, So that's why I'm hoping it's a two-door. That would make more sense and actually make it a lot cooler, honestly. It'd be kind of like a lifted, uh, you know, more off-roady version of a Veloster kind of, which would be kind of cool. Um, but anyway, we'll have to wait and see more of that next week. Um, Kia is also debuting a couple cars at the New York Auto Show. One is a production uh, compact crossover based on the Kona's platform. And so we're going to have more details of that next week. But the other thing uh, was this past week, there was a concept that leaked out called the Habanero, uh, spelled kind of like the Kia Nero. Um, and so this Habanero, uh, we have this one image here um, from a New York Auto Show newsletter that Car Scoops caught. Um, and so anyway, it's about the size of the normal Nero, but it's sportier and has a three-door setup here instead of, uh, you know, the four-door setup you get with the normal Nero. And of course, the much bolder looks there. Uh, but who knows what it would have powertrain-wise or anything like that. That. Um, but that could also result in a production vehicle. Maybe it's kind of the same underpinnings as um, that venue crossover or something we'll have to see. Um, but anyway, interesting to see that. Toyota has teased the all-new Highlander that's going to be revealed at the New York Auto Show. And so it's hard to tell too much because it's a slightly blurry image. This is part of like a 3D art display they have um, in New York. And so that's what this is, um, you know, so that's what you're looking at here is the new Highlander, but it's kind of got this weird 3D thing going on. Um, but that's intentional, so you don't see clearly what it looks like. Um, but expect it to be a little more conservative than other Toyota designs, most likely in it, you know, in it hopes to appeal to mainstream buyers, something a little less polarizing. Um, but it's probably going to be along the lines of a larger RAV4. That's what I've been hearing. We'll have to see. Um, but, you know, it looks similar to It's going to be a more evolutionary, I think, styling change than other Toyotas. And so anyway, we'll have to see more of that next week. Um, that's the end of the teasers here for the most part um, for New York. But in other Toyota news, there's a new report here from Automotive News this week uh, talking about the next-gen Tundra and Tacoma for the first time. And so they claim to have sources within Toyota that say that a new truck platform called F1 um, is going to be the basis for both the Tacoma and the Tundra. So mid-size truck and full-size truck will share the same platform. Now it'll probably be a modular platform so that it can expand to obviously be a different size uh, and have different capacities and stuff. Um, but they're saying this is also going to be used on a global scale. So I'm guessing outside of North America this will also be for Europe and stuff. Um, Anyway, it's all it's it's definitely gonna have to um, you come first for the Tundra because the Tundra is much older. That debuted in 2007 with its current generation versus the Tacoma just got a redo in 2015. Um, so they're saying Tundra could get this new platform as soon as the 2021 model year. And we already saw the new Tundra running around a few months ago back in the winter, um, and it was hiding something in the rear suspension area. So going with either you know some type of new more advanced suspension setup than uh, you know previous. Uh, Tundras or something, we'll have to see. Um, but yeah, so it's also possible since the Sequoia is based on the Tundra platform that the Sequoia, if they choose to uh, give that uh, a longer life, that that will most likely be on this platform as well. But there's no even rumors currently about what the future is for the Sequoia, if there is a future for it at all. So we'll have to wait and see. Other truck news though is about the new uh, Nissan Frontier. And so um, we have some details here on that uh, by again, a report from Automotive News. They say it's expected to debut towards the end of 2020 as a 2021 model, so about a year and a half away still. Um, it's going to supposedly be based on a heavily updated version of the current Frontiers platform. So, not a totally new platform. It's going to be kind of redoing the old platform, but that has worked in the past. And I mean, look at the, you know the Dodge Charger and Challenger working with an old platform, and you know there's that's starting to become a little more common these days as cost cutting and stuff is you know kind of getting tighter on some of these car companies. And so it's not going to be be based on the Navara pickup. 
pickup truck platform from other countries. Um, and so the sources uh, claim Nissan is doing this, uh, you know, refreshing of this platform um, instead to keep the cost low, both for them and for the consumer so that, you know, they don't have it being this massive vehicle that, uh, you know, balloons in price. So they're hoping, I guess, to keep some type of pricing edge because I think that's why the current Frontier, even though it's ancient, is still selling well because it's probably the cheapest and smallest uh, pickup truck you can get right now. And so that's, you know, what's helping sell them. So they want to keep that advantage. Um, and also because they want to, again, keep it a little bit smaller, I think, than um, what you're seeing with all these other mid-sized trucks that are ballooning in size. Um, they say, though, it's going to get a lot of changes. It's going to get futuristic styling, they say, that still looks like something a truck guy would want. That's, I guess, one of their sources claimed. Um, it'll also get an all-new powertrain consisting of a 3-liter V6 to replace, I think, the 4-liter V6 it has currently. And that new 3-liter will do 300 horsepower and will run through a new 7-speed automatic versus the 5-speed auto the current one has. So... Should be much more fuel efficient, more powerful, um, and have you know completely different looks, but still retain you know the lower cost, the smaller size. I think that people really appreciate about the Frontier. So it sounds like a pretty solid plan in my opinion. I know a lot of people when they read same platform, they immediately just discount it as being bad, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, especially when you're talking about trucks which don't have very advanced handling or uh, refinement characteristics. So, you know, there's really not much point in going crazy on a truck platform most of the time, especially when you're trying to keep the cost low. Other Nissan news though, uh, comes from Cars Direct who confirmed that the Nissan Note is uh, gonna be killed off here after the 2019 model year. And so Nissan spokesman, uh, has con uh, Nissan spokesman has confirmed this as well, um, saying that starting with the introduction of the redesigned 2020 model, the Versa will only be offered as a sedan. So Cars Direct says production of the Versa note is actually going to end as soon as this month, and the new Versa debuts actually the day that this video is going live here on April 12th. I filmed these on Thursday, uh, so they're ready by Friday. Um, so uh, of course we'll be retweeting on Twitter whenever that does get posted up here on Friday. Um, so you can check out my Twitter at Matt Moran if you want to see that. But anyway, interesting to hear that, and uh, I think the Versa note sold well. Um, I see a decent amount of them around, but. Um, with hatchbacks not being quite as popular as crossovers, I think they're kind of just uh, skipping that and just going straight to the sedan. Kind of makes sense. And so anyway, interesting to hear that. Infinity is showing the QS Inspiration concept at the Shanghai Motor Show this week. And while it's just a concept, uh, Reuters is reporting that this will lead into a production car. It's going to be the first EV from Infinity and says that it's going to be made in China. So the production version, they say, is going to be arriving around 2022, but Infinity says they do not plan to export it from China. So this means they're either going to build this elsewhere for the rest of the world or we're not getting it, one or the other. Um, in, in, previously, though, Infiniti did say that starting in 2021, every Infiniti model launch will be either an EV or an e-power hybrid, um, which means some type of hybridization um, on a gas engine. And so that's coming up soon. I mean, 2021, I'm guessing they mean calendar year. So that still gives them, you know, a year and a half or so here to wait. But... Um, I don't think they can afford to not bring this to the States if they are going to actually stick to that timeline. Um, so anyway, the sedan is going to be built on a flexible platform to help make the transmission to other models easier in the future. But Infinity does want to go towards being like a totally electric brand, I think. And um, so this is the first step towards that. And that design should also influence other future production models as well. Um, so interesting to see that. Infinity is also bringing a signature edition of the Q50 to the New York Auto Show, but basically it just seems like it gets uh, unique wheels, badges, aluminum interior trim, and supposedly new front rear bumpers. Although from the one picture we have there, the front bumper looks the same as any other Q50 to me, so I don't know um, what what the point of that is really, but uh, anyway, we'll have more details on that next week. We have some new details here on Aston Martin's Project 003 hypercar uh, that was shown in Geneva last month. So Car Scoops got got a uh, look at a dealer brochure that provides some specs here to give us an idea of just how insane the performance of this thing will be. And so the car um, will be produced, uh, will be producing around a thousand horsepower combined 
from its twin turbo V6 that they've already said is going to have, plus an electric motor on the front axle for all-wheel drive. They're only going to have about 160 less horsepower than the Valkyrie with its V12 if it does stick to that 1,000 horsepower number because um, the Valkyrie was, you know, 1160. And um, so dry weight for this Project 003 is reported to be at 2,976 pounds um, with a power-to-weight ratio of 750 brake horsepower per ton is what the brochure has said. So it's going to be using an 8-speed dual-clutch transmission, and they say that it allows it, the whole package is going to allow it to do 0 to 60 in less than 2.5 seconds. I think currently the best we get is like 2.7 out of a few hypercars and like Teslas. Um, so 2.5 could be the new record breaker. That's pretty crazy. Uh, and to put this into perspective, a McLaren 720S is about 100 pounds lighter but it has 200 less horsepower. So a slightly heavier McLaren 720S with an extra 200 horsepower um, is kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, sounds kind of like Street Speed 717's vehicle then basically. He's got a tuned 720S, uh, so probably a similar type of insanity. Top speed of at least 220 miles per hour, by the way, according to the brochure. Um, 500 are gonna be built with deliveries starting in uh, 2021 with a price of around 1.2 million. Um, so, Pretty pricey, uh, but if it looks anything like this concept, it's going to be gorgeous as well as being very, very fast. And so anyway, interesting to hear that. And some other crazy news of a slightly different type here. Uh, Car Magazine is reporting that Bugatti is awaiting approval from the Volkswagen Group executives to build a crossover influence sports car. So um, this sounds like kind of dancing around the word SUV. So just a few months ago, Bugatti's CEO said there will be no SUV from Bugatti. That sounds like he was mentioning a technicality uh, because it basically will be an SUV if you know they have their way with this plan. So supposedly this vehicle is happening. Um, and so even if they don't call it an SUV, it is still basically an SUV. It's the same thing as like Ferrari and trying um, the same denial with the Pura Songway where they say, oh yeah, well, it's not a normal SUV. Um, it's just a lifted performance vehicle. It's like, well, you have the GTC for Luso that fills that void you're trying to market. So um, I don't know. Anyway, Car Magazine, their report here says this Bugatti, it won't be a traditional SUV and it's gonna be something like a tour two-door version of the Lamborghini Urus that's sportier looking, lighter and faster with around a thousand horsepower, possibly from an electric boost, either paired up with the Urus's power plant or with its own unique power plant that does again have some type of electric boost to get it to a thousand horsepower. Um, and uh, if they do go forward with this, they say it would sit below the Chiron, but on top of every other model within the Volkswagen group. So this would still be above any Lamborghini, uh, anything like that. If it does get the green light, it's reported that they're planning to build 800 of these per year tops. Um, that's what they would be limited at. Um, and then it would be built in the current factory alongside the Chiron, which would mean they're going to have to expand that plant. So this would be a very big, uh, you know, kind of leap of faith, uh, you know, but I mean, it's, if it's an SUV, they'll sell tons of them and not really that much of a gamble. Um, but they say that even if this does get the green light soon, it's going to be at least another three to four years before it starts uh, going on sale. So still have a little ways to go here, but still kind of a bummer. I kind of got excited that Bugatti was taking a stand against SUVs, even though every other high-end automaker is going for them. Um, but it sounds like they're just going to join the fray. And even if it's a two-door, still like extra ground clearance just you know kills handling for the most part so um you know it is what it is these are the times we're living in um so anyway interesting to see that speaking of suvs though uh there's a bunch of jeep stuff here because the 2019 moab easter jeep safari is going on uh starting this saturday and jeep always brings some really cool concepts that kind of hint at some production items uh every year and so i usually don't talk about non-production vehicles like this but uh you know, like i said since some of these components can end up in production. I still think it's worth mentioning briefly. So here's a quick run through of all the ones they're bringing to the festival here. First is the Jeep Five Quarter, which is based on the 1968 M715, which is a military version of the old Gladiator truck, which is where the new one gets its roots from. Um, it's been completely reworked though. This old one, it's in, got a Hellcrate motor. It's also got totally different body panels and everything else, um, lots of carbon fiber and stuff. Next is the Jeep J6, which is like a two-door Gladiator in appearance that everyone wants. Uh, but this concept is actually based on the Wrangler Unlimited, 
unlike the Gladiator, which is you know totally unique underpinnings for the most part. So Jeep says they're gauging interest and know that some people want a two-door Gladiator, but they say right now justifying putting it into production is tough. That's what the Jeep uh, you know, brand executive has said. Uh, but they did say the wheels on this one could come to production though as a factory option if people like them enough. The next concept here is the way out concept, which is designed to allow theoretical owners to go way out into the middle of nowhere with uh, extra fuel tanks. It's got an awning and a full tent set up there to allow you to camp in it uh, whenever you're off the beaten path. The JT Scrambler is a retro looking gladiator here that has the most potential, I think, at least to be a special edition someday. Um, and I love the retro look of it. It's just, it's very, very cool. Uh, then there's the Gladiator uh, Gravity, which is basically just showing off the Mopar uh, accessory collection, their whole catalog, basically. The last one though, that I think is kind of funny is the Jeep Flat Bill, which is a tongue in cheek homage to the Bro Dozers um, with Jeep actually saying, the name is derived from the style of hat that people into this look like to wear <laughs> so so it's um it's a, it's kind of funny they continue on with this theme uh, they don't have any pictures of these things but supposedly the seats say bra on them and uh there's even a sticker on it somewhere in the vehicle that says don't bro me if you don't know me <laughs> so, so it's kind of funny uh that they're they they know their customers they know that some of them do enjoy the bro dozers and so they made this it's supposed to be like a motocross support truck um but it's kind of funny how they're just um you know playing up the stereotypes and stuff which is pretty great um anyway the last bit of uh, news here that come out of the easter jeep safari and the last news story this week is many are wondering if the hellcat motor fits in the wrangler gladiator supposedly Jeep's brand chief um, told Australian media last week that everyone's been asking them about this and they say, he says it's technically possible and that it fits like a glove, but the fitment is too tight to make it viable for production. So um, he explained further to the drive website that there is no airspace around the engine. So you have no crush space. You have nothing that can be used to absorb energy in a crash. It's not a problem to put it in other than emissions and fuel economy, except that it would never pass any crash tests. And that's the problem. So, um, you know, if you want to put one in aftermarket, go for it. Just don't ever run into anything at any kind of speed because you will not be in good shape. I think that's the takeaway there. Um, but if you uh, are not afraid of death, go for it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, even though the Hellcat might not fit great, you know, maybe a smaller V8 or something could be an option, especially for the Gladiator. Maybe that would be kind of cool someday. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but anyway, it's good to finally have a solid, um, you know, news about that because that was something even I wondered for a while. I was wondering if they'll ever do a Hellcat version. Sounds like that's never going to happen, um, but at least there's a good reason why. I would argue maybe just make the hood longer, make the bumper longer, give you that crash space in the front, give it a long nose version with the Hellcat, and you could kind of work around it that way maybe. I don't know. But anyway, um, interesting to hear all that. But yes, yeah, so that's it for all the news this week, guys. So again, please uh, stay tuned for all the New York Auto Show videos next week. Hopefully you enjoy those. will be starting on uh, Wednesday morning and we'll continue on. I will also not have a car review on Wednesday because of that because I'm just going to be uploading tons of videos from the Auto Show, probably around a dozen videos or so. So I apologize if I'm bombarding your uh, notifications and your subscription box there um, for a day or or two, uh, but it's not going to last forever. Uh, nothing to unsubscribe about. Uh, just lots of uh, vehicles debuting next week. And uh, yeah, then when I'll probably have some type of wrap up or something, uh, you know, in the following week as well. But yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this weekly update. Thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Take care.